we can call um, the finance meeting to order um, for tonight. And we'll be going over the schools, <coughs> police, the fire, and some items with us. Uh, and then after that, um, I think we'll then run to inspections because um, I believe Tommy has another meeting with uh, buildings or another one of the um, uh, municipal meetings to go to. So, um, Carolyn, if you want to. Sure. You guys can hear me okay? Because I am I am known to not unmute myself. Classic. So, so good evening. <laughs> good evening, everybody. Um, so I wanted to provide you with an introduction before the budget hearings, just to review how we prepared the budget um, that I'm recommending. And I know uh, you've listened to me do a little bit of a couple introductions before. It's just um, kind of setting uh, the whole scene of what it's been like for the cap past couple months and um, just providing you some feedback. Uh, and um, I asked the select board in November what their guidelines for the budget would be, and they asked for a level funded and a level service budget. With that charge, um, I met with every department, either individually or together with the town treasurer. In some cases, a level funded budget was possible. In most cases, a level service budget was the responsible and sensible budget that was considered. I wanna emphasize that even the level service budget were scrutinized and required justification from the department heads. Some department heads returned to tweak further their budgets. There was a great deal of conversation back and forth throughout the, the budget preparations to look at alternative approaches to certain expenses. We brainstormed, we looked at ways um, to, to centralize expenses or increase efficiencies. All of these departments involved in those type of discussions understood the challenges. And if they were able, I have to tell you, they agreed to reduce um, or pause in their, in, you know, in trying to provide level services. That is why there's a town administrator recommendation column, which should be the focus of the attention throughout the hearings. That's the column in the blue, which also includes a COLA increase that I explained the last time we met of 1.5%. The percentage increase or decrease that you'll see in those columns on percentages, um, that's based on the town administrator's budget recommendations. Before I ask Linda to update the committee on revenue, and then we're gonna pass it on to Dan for an impact analysis of tax rate increases, I wanna respectfully ask the finance committee members to consider thinking about your role as defined in the Association of Town Finance Committee handbooks. If you haven't, seen that or had access to that. Um, I, it was a huge help to me when I was a finance committee uh, member for Wilbraham. And I'm just gonna quote what under what their role is, the role of the finance committee. So once developed, that budget is presented to the finance committee, representing the legislative branch, the town meeting. In effect, the local finance committee has the same role as the House Ways and Means Committee in the state legislature. It is the finance committee's responsibility to receive the budget, budgets from the, executive, um, from the executive branch. And in Hadley's case, the bylaw gives the town administrator the authority to prepare the budget for your recommendation. To analyze the budget, you have hearings where the department heads and the public can testify and present a balanced budget to town meeting. The budget should reflect the finance committee's decisions based upon their best judgment of the issues and finances of the town. And that's where I'm gonna ask you to lean on those department heads and myself to find out what those unique issues are for each department. And then rely on our finance team to let you know how the finance, uh, the finance, the finance environment and landscape is for Hadley. Um, tonight and for the next several meetings, the department heads will be sharing you a lot about their department. And I think you will be really impressed with what they have done this past year with a significantly reduced budget imposed by a pandemic. So I just wanna remind you the budget that you're looking at for level service and, and what well, we're gonna be looking at level service, which is included in my recommendation is based on a budget that was re reduced three times last year. 
So it's not your it's not being compared to a budget that would have been different um, had the pandemic not not have happened. So Linda is now going to kind of give you an update on the revenues and has some other thoughts to share as well. I didn't give you a warning, Linda. Sorry. <laughs> I think I, I think I'm good. I want to make sure that uh, I'm sharing now. Does that? Can you see the revenues sheet on the mm -hmm. screen? Okay. All right, so we're, we are, we're really, it's, it's not that we don't have revisions, we don't wanna go through it all, but we feel like we need to make a, a, a correction to how uh, the real estate section, the property tax was perceived and how, it's, how we've heard it told um, and, and repeated. The purpose of this sheet, this is a revenue sheet. This is how do our revenues in a certain category compare to last year? And um, you've heard, you already know how I feel about percentages, uh, about how they're misleading. And the one place I didn't remove them when I made my presentation is the revenues uh, section, and it, it was misconstrued. So when you see here that we have a 7.2% increase in taxes that we received in 22 over 21, that's in the revenue, that's in the real estate taxes we receive. That doesn't mean your bill is going up by 7.2%. So we, we backed up, up to the other section. Um, you have to remember we get new growth in, every year. We get new construction, new projects, uh, new additions on homes. And of course, then we get to raise the taxes or raise more taxes on that new construction. So that goes in there too. And that's more revenue to us, but it doesn't impact anybody else's bill. Now, I'm not saying their bill isn't going to go up, but please don't use 7.21% and tell people that. And the other thing I want to correct, and um, we were, we were, well, I, I'll speak for myself. I was feeling a little <clears throat> the way that was uh, that was mm, being interpreted too, because we fully understood from the special town meeting in the fall, and I even reviewed some of the meetings around that time. We understood that this was a one-year reprieve on property taxes, and that this coming year there would be a jump and that people understood it, but wanted the one year reprieve anyways. I understood that's how it's voted. Where you take it from there is fine. I just didn't want you. We, we wanted you to understand that we did exactly what we thought was understood by raising the taxes at this level. Um, and um, and uh, yeah, I mean, you take it from there, but um, as I said, we did what we thought was understood. And so the other thing, the I want to say about this is that if you want to know the percentage of taxes, that's a different question. That's that's Dan Zadonik's department. He will talk about what that has, what the percentage is increase on a particular, um, particular homes. But um, again, these columns show our take in the town. This is our, to our benefit. This isn't something to look at and go, oh my. Anyways, that's a separate discussion about uh, how much you're going to raise taxes. Um, so I would like to, um, I will now show on the screen what's uh, Dan's uh, chart. And this is response to Paul Benjamin's request about uh, wanting to see what it really means on the household. And that was a good question to ask. And it gave us the opportunity to, um, to, to put this together and to explain it. So if we just take a few minutes, because I know we want to get onto the budget, but I think this is important and, and Dan's ready to give an explanation on the sheet that's, can you see this now? It says tax rate options. Okay, we're working. All right, go ahead, Dan. Uh, what this chart does is the FY21 is this year's tax bill. The first column is assessments. I went in $25,000 increments. Our average is highlighted, that's the 350. So the average bill this year was $4,200. And what I did was the second column is just going up the two and a half percent plus new growth for next year. That would mean increasing the tax levy by 401,930. And each column going across, I increased it basically a half a percent at three, three and a half, four, four and a half, and five. And then I did the full increase, which would be the six and a quarter, which is what the average bill would go up if everything was, we went to the full tax levy. Now, the, the key things with this is it does not assume, this does not assume any value changes for fiscal 22. And residential values, it appears, may be going up. We might be able to hold them depending on 
certain factors. Uh, but commercial values are gonna, gonna drop in some cases. So that, that may shift money onto the, or taxes onto the residential class, but we're looking at possibly recommending doing a split rate this year, which would shift it back until the rest, until the commercial value, values come back. So what this does, if you look at the highlighted line, the 4,200 was is this year, next year would be 4,463. So it would increase $263. If we hadn't reduced the levy last year, our tax rate would have been 1247. So it would be basically the 4% column it would have been 43, a little less than 43.68, probably about 43.65. So you're looking at a hundred dollars increase from this year. Any questions? Oh, oh, no, that's great. That's helpful. Thank you. Uh, is this something that you could uh, send to all of us? Uh, I, I thought I had. Is um, is oh, yeah. It's Did you just do it tonight because I didn't get, I didn't notice it yet. Um, it was part of the same um, packet that had the, the, the budget, budget hearings and the budget hearings. Okay, sorry. I must you don't, you don't have it, Amy? I probably do. I just printed out certain things. So I just. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, I think the one that it was not highlighted. Um, uh, I, th I think I grabbed the one that was not highlighted. So I would be happy to send this again anyways. So you can see, because the highlighted one is the average household. So that's what Dan's showing, going up by 263. And as I recall, the select board saying at the meetings in the fall, you could be seeing a, a jump of about $300 next year. So it's just about exactly what, it's, it's actually less than what was being said at the meetings for the, for the, um, um, for the fall town meeting. But anyway, so you all take it from there, but I just want to make sure you understood where we were what we were working with and, and how we came up the, with the figures and what that impact is. Okay. Oh. I'd, I'd like to just jump in and suggest that this be in the packets at the town meetings for people to see too. I don't know if that would create more. I think it might help people in the audience understand what tax increases are, how we held them back and, you know, what, what the reset's going to have to be. Right. And we haven't actually gotten this to the select board yet. Uh, we no, just uh, once, came up with this this afternoon. So we'll, yes, we'll get that. I think that's a good suggestion. We'll ask, we'll ask select board to include this. Yeah. Uh, may I ask a question of Dan while he's here? Um, Dan, you talked about having a, uh, we may switch to a split um, tax basis between commercial and residential. And did you say that that would be temporary? I, I didn't understand that. Yeah, because of because of COVID nineteen, certain sections of commercial values are the values are going to be reduced next year. Most notably, hotels, restaurants, bars, gym, uh, gyms, movie theaters, things that really couldn't open. Yeah. So their values are going to drop on a temporary basis until everything goes back to normal. Yes. So it might be worthwhile looking at a split rate for fiscal twenty two, and possibly fiscal twenty three until the values recover and then reverting back to a single rate. Okay. It would hold the tax burden steady so that somebody that the commercial section right now, the sector is paying 35% of the tax levy. And you don't really want to see that drop to 28 or 27%. And then a few years later, go back to 35. It'd be better to keep it level across the board. I'm sure commercial would disagree, but. Yes. Okay, thank you, <laughs> thank you. And I think, Amy, we're wanna okay. move on with the budgets. Great, okay, so why don't we uh, thank everyone for uh, uh, giving us that insight. Now let's uh, jump into the budgets and we can start with uh, Tommy under um, doing building inspections. Thank you for putting this up, <laughs> Linda. This is helpful. Three. Uh, let's see. Is Tommy here? Yes. How's yes. everybody doing? Okay, there you are. <laughs> okay. If uh, 
I don't know how, uh, if there's, if you wanted to go through your budget and um, explain anything that you feel like you, you know, we should know, um, give us any insight, that would be great. Sure. Okay. I could start with um, the admin, the uh, admin salary being that uh, she, she only had uh, third, 25 hours last year. And that's why she had quite a bit of compensation time and really was supposed to have been 35 is what, you know, we had thought. And so that would be one of the bigger um, increases in it because of getting her the 35 for building uh, as opposed to the 25 last year. The um, another increase was to get a um, we're online now. We, we implemented the whole online program and it's going forward pretty well. And so all the inspectors, including myself, have a tablet. So in order to enter and, and um, get everything right on the site, I had requested um, an extra in my phone stipend for a jet pack um, to have the, like a hotspot. So that was, um, you know, $50 a month for that. And then the other increase was the fuel. I have been out. We're actually up at this point, just building alone, not, not including um, electrical or plumbing. We're up 40,000 in last year, what we brought in, and we still have almost three months to go. So that kind of explains um, you know, where we are as far as busy. The um, way up on permits as well, it's not just the, the cost of the permits uh, being more expensive. The um, been very busy because we've tried to keep all the part-time and local inspectors out and I've been working the extra to, you know, avoid having more people in the office and in the town hall and some of them are older. So it's better not to have them out in inspections anyway. Um, the, you find a tax collector we, with the online program and even before we wouldn't issue a permit until we made sure water and taxes were all up to date. So we've, um, you know, brought in quite a bit or collected, you know, past due taxes and water uh, bills with that. And another thing we've um, done is the river RVs we're going to be permitting and that's in the works now. So it's, it's been a busy year. Okay. I, uh, I do have a few questions for you. Uh, so you, you mentioned DD's hours that, um, uh, I remember that happening last year and where the, the hours uh, didn't happen like we thought they would, but her hours are split into three different groups, correct? And are you, is she now just yours? Or I mean, is she just in that one spot? Or are you moving around? Um, I'm actually looking to do the 30, because originally it was going to be the 40 hours, but now that we're so, um, busy in building more than I ever thought. Um, we were doing the 35 and we had spoken um, with the, still with the planning board to keep me for five hours in the planning. Um, the other thing is too, is because I was assistant accountant and assistant treasurer um, that I am still, if anything ever happens where, you know, we do slow down a bit depending on what time of year that I'm always there available to help out on any of those other, you know, with Linda or anybody else. Okay, so let me just make sure I understood. So five hours a week with the planning board, 35 yes. hours a week with, with inspections. Correct. Um, and then if needed, but right now it shouldn't, we probably shouldn't be in the budget under accounting or treasurer because you are booked up for 40 hours. Correct. Okay. And, and Amy, there's an explanation right at the bottom of the page. Yep. So anytime you saw a change like that, we outlined it because you'll see it impacted on another budget and we'll refer back to it. Okay. I figured we would see that. I, that was a big confusion last year because you were in so many budgets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, and so you mentioned how busy you were. Do you foresee that hap continuing year after year? Do you think this is like uh, you're really extra busy and it has something to do with the pandemic? You're busier. I mean, some of the, you know, Home Depot might be busier because people were didn't have anything else to do but home projects. Um, do you think this is going to be the new norm? Well, some of it, 
um, yes, of course, is because of COVID, but we did go up on the fees within this past year. And so that has made a real drastic change in uh, what we're taking in also. That's what's helped in our increase. Um, and also the fact that um, when uh, Tommy is out there and if we are you know, catching people without a permit, then you know, the fee is doubled. So um, it's, but yeah, it seems like it's, it's been consistent more than last year, especially. Yeah. I think in Hadley, we're going to see the commercial continue. Um, I'm just surprised there's so many remodels now going on, but um, as busy as they are in the commercial, you know, the Target, the um, uh, three new stores. So, I mean, in, in a pandemic to have all that coming in commercial wise is, was amazing to me. Um, residential, I know people weren't traveling, so maybe they did things they were waiting for, you know, then, but the commercial, it, it can only strive in, in Hadley, I would see. <clears throat> And you think that uh, the campers are going to be taking up a lot more of your time now, too? Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I don't have any more questions unless anyone else. Does. Oh, um, actually, I do have a few more questions. Are you going to be going over the um, uh, gas and the uh, plumbing inspections, yeah. too? Oh, Want, me to Want me to explain, Tom? Yeah, sure, please. Yeah, please okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, on the, this is the page with the gas inspector and the plumbing inspector. They've gone right down to zero. All right, we are, um, uh, that's why I've shaded the mountain gray. Next year, you won't even see these. So going back over to the inspections, you see we have the, the grade one here, the gas inspector is here and the plumbing inspector. And then um, uh, up here, I mean, the gas and plumbing inspector. They were added to the building inspector's budget as separate um, lines. The hours for the assistance in the gas and plumbing and local inspector, the alternates were all merged into another line. Um, and there's one more to come. Um, there is uh, the electrical inspector and um, maybe uh, Carolyn wants to update, but the idea is that we, for some reason, that one was going through a revolving fund, all the fees going into the revolving fund and the inspector paid out of the revolving fund and we were never seeing it in the budget. The thing is we can't, we profit from that. Uh, at the end of the year, the balance, uh, except for 10,000 in the inspector's fund would get moved over to the general fund. But I think it's time, we, we decide it's time to capture that money. And we're going to be, so this budget will be increasing by the amount of uh, what, um, we, we just aren't there yet, but we will be soon because it, I have to go back and study the last few years. We're definitely coming out ahead in, inspectors. So the, um, the electrical inspector line will uh, will increase this budget, but over on the revenues, you're going to see that go up by probably another fifteen to twenty thousand dollars higher than the than the expense here. So I hope to have that information ready for you soon, Carolyn. You want to explain how we're we're getting there from here? Getting where from here? Sorry, Linda. Uh, on the revolving there. fund? How, how yeah, we, legally, I I, I checked with legal, and it looks like we can get, dissolve that and um, to do exactly that. So it would benefit the general fund. Um, and if I can just do a little town administrator, a little um, editorial here, I know it's really easy to look at um, some of the departments as just revenue generating departments, but I just wanna remind you that the primary purpose um, of, the, of the building inspection department is safety. And that's why it, that's why we present the building inspection along with the other public safety departments. So um, I just, uh, I hear it a lot. Like, you know, Tommy's just bringing in a, so much money. I, and it's great, but it means he's increasing the safety of the community. So I just want I had to put that little editorial in. Well, since um, I have a question for you, Carolyn, what, what sure. in this budget, I'm looking at it and I'm seeing all the uh, salaries um, and I see where it has level funded, and then I see where the admin um, recommendations are. Why, in this particular case, you didn't increase colas on any of these? Mm -hmm. So those are those are stipends. Okay. The inspections are stipends. Okay. And so they get, and we just changed. We just uh, 
uh, changed what they get per inspection. Mm -hmm. So we just increased those, if you remember, a couple of select board meetings ago. Okay, that makes sense. So if they're stipends and they're not under employees, they're different. I mean, they are employees, but it's a little different. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And just one other thing I wanted to mention, I my um, contract is up uh, May 4th, would be my contract. Um, is for, So you knew Carolyn. Okay. So, yeah. yeah so so we'll, we may need to, res we, we, we may need to revisit the first line there and see what gets decided. All right, wonderful. Does anyone else have any um, questions for building inspections? No? All right, well, I guess um, it, I don't really have any questions because it's, it's um, pretty straightforward. You don't have a, a, a lot of changes. It's just a couple of wages and they are, you've explained them. So um, wonderful, well, thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for letting us go first. No, no problem. <laughs> Good luck on your next meeting. Off to the planning Thanks. board. Thank you. Yeah, I hope they All right. All right. So now if we could um, do the schools, because I think that will be somewhat straightforward as well. Uh, that would be fabulous. And uh, Dr. McKenzie, if you want to... Um, I just see the one line item, but if you want to go ahead and give any explanation or sure. anything would so, be great. I think it is important. One, I, I just want to start always by saying thank you to FinCom for your service, to the town for supporting the schools, to the residents of the town. Um, we They consistently invest in public education in this community. We don't take that lightly and we appreciate it deeply. And we in turn want to demonstrate our support for the town. And uh, while we, our local contribution request is level funded, it is important that people understand that the, it, we anticipate the school department budget in total will probably go up by close to 3%. We can keep a local contribution level because like the town, the schools will receive funding, what's referred to as ESSER II and ESSER III funding that has to do with COVID. For example, some of the expenses that we've incurred this year and will continue to incur the next year, we have a weekly pool testing program so we can test our students and our faculty who choose to be tested for COVID-19. We anticipate continuing with our pool testing program definitely through the fall and we'll see how far in the next year that um, we want to continue that program. That program alone runs about $113,000 annually. Um, there are other expenditures associated with COVID that we incurred this year, as you know, because the town was very generous in setting aside some of its COVID funding to support the schools. Because of the, oh goodness, COVID Recovery Act, what did the FF stand for? The FFCRA, I can't remember what the acronym stood for now. Due to FFCRA, um, employees were able to utilize uh, paid time if their childcare was not available as a result of schools being closed. So we had a handful of employees who had no choice but to, thank you, Family First Coronavirus Relief Act. <laughs> of course, public safety <laughs> knows that. Um, and uh, so our, uh, we had a number of, a handful of faculty who had, they, they didn't have available childcare. Their children's schools were not open. Uh, we had to invest in substitutes this year. The town funding assisted with that. It's also helped us to get the schools open and to allow us to open safely, provided us with air purifiers, provided us um, with plenty of personal protective equipment. It allowed us to do um, inspections of all of our schools and make sure that our ventilation was at a place that would make it possible for children and staff to return. It allowed us to purchase additional desks because we initially had to keep children six feet apart and move classrooms to other spaces. So we um, are able, COVID is expensive. 
It's extremely expensive. It required a significant investment in fiscal year 21. It required investment at a time in which revenues were hit terribly in all municipalities, and it will continue to require investments and a tremendous amount of work going forward. The schools are fortunate that um, the, the government has recognized that cost, has set aside money to cover those costs. And I'm extremely grateful that the schools can do everything that we need to do and st at, while uh, requesting a level funded local contribution. And it's our sincere hope that coupled with our ability um, in this year in fiscal 21 to return monies to the town. Part of the reason we were able to do that is that we have seen a significant uptick in school choice receiving. Uh, we've had some of our strongest years lately in families choosing to come to Hadley Public Schools. So the combination of those two things, requesting a level local contribution and the money being returned to town, it's certainly our hope that the town then has the capacity to invest in other programs, services, department, departments and personnel that work in the town. Part of the wonderful, part of what's so wonderful about working in Hadley is it's a team. I don't feel like the schools are somewhere else. I feel like a part of a team in town hall. I am, I work with colleagues who support the schools and I'm eager to support these other departments. So it is pretty straightforward. Um, and, um, but I'm certainly happy to, to answer any questions. And I hope that this allows the town to make some other strategic investments in its programs, services, personnel, all of those things just benefit the community so much. We'll certainly take any questions. So uh, how much do you think that um, through what you're talking about with the FFCRA that you receive in a year? So are you asking, are you asking me what the town set aside for us in FY21? Are you asking anticipated what we expect to receive? What, I'm sorry, which, what would you like to know? Well, like you, men you mentioned uh, the testing program, you mentioned about a hundred and it was about 113,000 a year is what you gave. 113,000 a year for the cost for the lab, for the test. That doesn't include the cost of the two sub nurses to um, come in on a per diem and administer the test, collect the samples and implement the program. That's just the cost of the testing. That's just the lab cost. Oh, that was just the lab cost? That's okay. just the lab cost. And is that being covered by the government, right? That's the We will use our ESSER funding to cover that next year. So we don't have to put that in the budget. Right. Correct. Okay. So I was just looking to see, I I'm kind of curious because um, what did it, I believe you've received quite a bit at the school with the CARES Act. I just was wondering if you, to know a little bit more about what exactly you received. You talked about the air purifiers, some of that in the desks, that was interesting. How about any cameras? Have you, do we have the cameras? I know we got the laptops, but how about cameras in this, in the um, schools? Uh, so that way, you know, people want to still remote right. in. Yeah, so some things, so with examples of what was spent uh, using the CARES funding that went to the town in fiscal year 21. That's where we spent money, some money on personal protective equipment. We spent uh, right around $70,000 on air purifiers. We were fortunate that the, in addition to that, we applied for a grant and the state, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education on top of that gave us some additional air purifiers that we did not have to pay for. That was critical for some of our larger spaces. Um, we uh, purchased replacement uh, purifier filters for those air purifiers. There's no point in having an air purifier if you don't keep the replacement filters up to date. Our heating, ventilation, inspection, repair, cleaning, and disinfecting it was a tall order this summer. It was, it was nothing short of miraculous that we opened doors for students on day one, and they have been open every single day except for uh, a brief period in January. We, um, the substitutes, for personnel that were on FFCRA paid leave. Um, all of that was uh, initial CARES funding in FY21, roughly $223,000. What we anticipate to spend 
some, not all, of what we anticipate to spend using uh, what now is called ESSER money. Um, and now I can't remember what that stands for either. It's a but ESSER money. Um, so additional to your point, we did purchase a number, and some of these we used uh, some grant funding that was provided by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. In some cases, we used school choice funding. We had to purchase a great deal of tech, right? So document cameras, Chromebooks, making sure we have plenty of Chromebooks here. We had to reconfigure our Wi-Fi access points in the school, particularly in Hopkins, where they were originally placed. Um, it wasn't working well. The age of the building, the bricks, the construction of the building was making things really problematic. So we invested significantly in internet and updating our internet capacity and our Wi-Fi capacity in devices for students, in devices for faculty, in document cameras, in, in whiteboards. Um, next year we'll use ESSER funding. So we have a, we had a tech person to manage all of our devices, be our network administrator and troubleshoot tech problems. Next year, we will use some of our, our this ESSER funding and we've used some this year already to pay for contracted services. So we won't be hiring an employee, which would result in additional expenses falling to the town side, but we'll use a contracted service provider. We're budgeting roughly probably $65,000 for that. I told you $113,000 for lab tests, uh, lab costs for pool testing. Per diem rates for nurses to administer the test to nurses over the course of the year will be just over $25,000. Um, this isn't everything. Uh, oh, we will be expected from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education to invest in opportunities, whether those are summer opportunities, vacation opportunities, extended school day opportunities, um, that hasn't been defined yet, but would be expected to invest in programs and services to address any learning loss that occurred as a result of COVID. Um, so we don't know what that will be yet, but we know that we'll need to invest in that as well. Those are some examples. It's, um, that is um, an illustrative list, but not exhaustive. So is, are they still, are there still government still giving out money to the schools or is it all gone? Is there no, so the, what I said, what we're spending next year yeah. is next year's money. All these things I've listed, right, is yeah. next year's money. Um, there'll be, we anticipate additional money calling ESSER 3 money. That money, though, can be spent over a longer period of time. And so once we understand the rules that will accompany that money, the expectations, what it can be spent on, when it should be spent, then we would make decisions about what made the most makes the most sense in terms of when we should spend that money and on what. Um, we certainly want to be careful. We talked about this recently at school committee that um, where possible, we want to make sure that we avoid setting up a funding cliff, which is something that happened with the Recovery Act back in uh, after the 2008. Um, financial catastrophe and then the recovery that occurred afterwards. So it was tremendous investment uh, put into schools and in some cases in towns as well. Uh, some folks made the mistake of investing heavily in, for example, investing heavily in personnel. It's not to say that that is always a bad idea, meaning hiring new people, but when the money goes away, then it creates a problem. Mm -hmm. Now um, it's unlikely I don't want to say for sure, but it's unlikely that we may be running a pool testing program three years down the road. So something like lab costs don't create a funding cliff because the demand will probably no longer exist after a period of time. So you don't have to worry about associated unemployment costs or things of that nature. So I'll, I'll tell you where I'm trying to get at is, so I've heard of other, some, some, what some of the other schools are doing. One school mentioned that they, um, you know, they're getting all this money. They put in cameras to all every single classroom. They redid their bathrooms. They redid their their um, their drinking fountains. They've re done uh, stuff to the school. So, yeah. does the does the government give the schools a certain amount of money 
Um, and uh, yes. each one yeah. is allocated, and then you decide what to do with it, or do, per project you go and say, hey, here's a no. good project, will you fund it? No, no they, they tell us every school gets, as it should be, it depends on size. So some of these schools that have made some wonderful in, uh, capital investments, they receive millions of dollars. So we're looking in ESSER two funding at just shy of 200,000 at about 196.6 in ESSER two. But as I said to you, the labs alone are $114,000. But we get less because we're smaller. Some schools got millions and um, they've made major infrastructure investments or capital investments, excuse me. Oh. Um, so it, it, it is not the same for every school. And just like any grant, there's a request for, there's an RFP posted, a request for proposal. The grant instructions tell you what are allowable expenditures and what are not allowable expenditures. Um, it's, it's pretty much anything that's COVID related. So if they redid a bathroom, they didn't just redecorate with that money. They probably cited that the bathroom had poor ventilation. And in fact, what they did was address the vent in ventilation and in doing so, ended up doing a whole bunch of other stuff. I was just asking, because it would be great if we could get the kid, the girls locker room in there. <laughs> yeah, so what I am doing, just so you know, Amy, I will try again. I just was notified, this will be year three, yeah. uh, to apply for Mass School Building Authority. Um, so I've, I've tried three years now, and we really are going to emphasize the connection between that in that the, the ventilation is an issue in that uh, locker room. And hopefully that that will make our project more appealing. But I hope it doesn't take me every year till I retire, but I will not stop asking for Mass School Building Authority money until I retire. I'll exactly. ask for it every year. <laughs> Maybe this is the year. They seem to be giving out a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I Maybe hope so. Maybe this is the year. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> okay. Great. Well, thanks for answering all those questions. I'm uh, happy to. Anyone else? Oh, good report. Thank you. I would just like to say, you know, I, I feel throughout this crisis, I have been comforted, uh, Annie, by knowing that you were leading our schools. Your competence <laughs> and your, um, your sense of, of what is best and what is right and good for our kids in our town has uh, led um, this school through this crisis. And I'm, I'm grateful for your efforts and your, um, your intelligence and your, your heart that you've, you've led the school with. Thank you, Valerie. That really means the world to me. And I need to say this because I wrote it down. I also want to compliment that budget presentation and Dan Zadonik. I mean, that chart, you guys just do a great job. You know what's so clear there is that even, so if, if the investment is to correct, like the far column, that $263 increase, that's 22 bucks a month. And I don't say that lightly because I know every penny counts and there are families that really struggle. And I also know there are a lot of people who spend more than that on Netflix. That's 22 bucks a month. And what you get in this town for that, wow, it's a lot more than I get from my cable company and I don't got an eye. Um, so Dan, that was an excellent presentation. I just wanted to make sure I said that. And Valerie, thank you for your kind words and thank you all for your service. It's okay, I'm gonna go home and eat. That's what I'm gonna do. All right. So thank you so much. If you're good with me. Thank you very much. All right. Bon appetit. All right. Thanks. Bye. 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 Okay. Wonderful. So uh, now we can, if we can move on to the, we're moving right along here. <laughs> this is great. We can move right over to the uh, police. That would be great. Um, and um, I sent everyone out some um, documents too for that. I don't know if you had a chance to look them over, but um, Mike had quite a bit there for us to look at, um, to go over the line items. He had explanations in there. So that was great. So take it away, Mike. Uh, all right. Thank you, Amy. Um, thank you, uh, Finance Committee. Uh, I, I do want to say one thing. If, uh, if anybody wants to, after this presentation, um, just give me a single line item like Annie has. Uh, I will not object to that. <laughs> we'll put it all in one category. I'm sure it'll be fine. Nobody will have any problems with that at all. Um, 
So, yes, you all have probably a three or four page document that's kind of uh, like a fact sheet. I'm going to try not to read that whole thing. I want you all to be able to kind of take a look at it at your own uh, leisure uh, as we work through this. I'm going to try to hit the highlights because I do have, you know, 20 or so line items in the police and then, you know, another eight or 10 for dispatch. Um, to, uh, to Linda's, uh, Linda's email earlier kind of, um, uh, shined a light on, on something that I wanted to kind of touch on, which was, you know, try to, uh, try to, to explain, you know, what last year was like, uh, for your department. And I know that she wanted it to focus, you know, obviously on COVID because that affected everyone. Uh, but I just think that, you know, police and dispatch, uh, and fire as the fire chief is going to explain to you had a bit of a different, um, a different role in uh, how things how things went last year, and police specifically not only had to deal with COVID, but a lot of other things as well. Um, the officers here really kind of tried to take on another uh, some other roles, and and were delivering meals to senior citizens. They're still doing that actually today. Um, you know, did a lot of community events to try to. Uh, just kind of get their faces out there and show that we're not uh, we're not what was being portrayed on the news for a, a year straight. Um, they were doing birthday parades. You know, the fire department was doing it as well. And uh, to be completely honest with you, I, it's, I find it hard to put into words um, what last year really was like uh, for for these officers and the dispatchers as well uh, coming into work every day because uh, statistically speaking, it was actually one of our busiest years ever. Uh, we had more calls for service. We had more, unfortunately, more arrests um, than we've ever had. Um, we have, I have somebody in the, they have somebody in the cell block right now for uh, felony um, domestic violence, strangling of a family member. Um, nothing changed for us except for the fact that we were busier and uh, the officers took some some abuse out there uh, that uh, they didn't really deserve. So one of the things that I'm going to focus on is retention, uh, retention for these for these employees. And I know that that's something that Carolyn has been uh, working on since she started here. Um, and it's not just for police, but there are some things that are going on right now in, you know, police reform and things like that, that are having, we're starting to see a significant impact on where we are headed in law enforcement. Uh, and so we really, in our departments, are going to have to focus even with even more laser clarity um, on retention of the and possibly recruitment for new ones. Um, Right now, there's a, there's a state police and civil service exam being offered. There are approximately 2,700, I was told just yesterday from a member of the governor's office, there are approximately 2,700 to 3,000 people signed up to take this exam. Generally speaking, they have between 18 and 20,000 people signed up around this same time. Um, no one wants to be a police officer right now. So... Not only is retention going to be an issue, but uh, the pool of candidates and certainly qualified candidates that we are going to be able to select from is rapidly shrinking. So that being said, um, just quickly, um, the police chief salary, um, I just so everybody knows, I uh, went to my contract negotiations just very recently and I did not request any pay increase. I didn't negotiate any pay increase for the next three years. I simply asked that if the town was able to see their way to give the rest of the town employees an increase, that I would get the same. So the increase that you see there is what Carolyn has added based upon what she is requesting for all other town employees. The same goes for our administrative assistant, and the increase for those full-time officers is for their step increase that is already in their contract and has been for a while now. So those are the three increases as far as wages go. I do want to say that with the clerical situation, um, I believe that all the members of this finance committee were the same folks who were on the committee presentation, I believe it feels like 10 years ago now, but um, before COVID, 
when I had requested another full-time police officer as well as a, another administrative person to assist us with accreditation. That is something that we are still working towards. And with some of the changes that are coming with police reform, we need to continue to head down that road to become an accredited police department, not because it's the best way to operate in law enforcement now, but also because it's going to put us in a position to be able to exceed the uh, requirements that are being set forth by this police reform bill. I have no intention of being just good enough um, when it comes to how we operate. So obviously that's not gonna, those requests are not coming now, but I just wanna start the conversation so everybody is aware that as we move forward to the future, um, we are really going to head in that direction and it is going to require some assistance, whether it be civilian um, employees or potentially uh, you know, police officers down the road. That's for another day, but I just wanted to kind of throw that out there. The overtime increase, very small increase, that is simply to account for the step increases that the officers have. You will probably notice, and when you take a look at the sheet that I gave you, that overtime request is less than it was probably five years before I took over. And I think we have five or six more employees than we had at that point. Um, we have the overtime under control. Um, this last year did not help. There are certain instances where we really had, you know, with uh, civil unrest and the potential of protests and all kinds of other things, there were several weekends where we had to have all hands on deck. So unfortunately, that's the worrisome part about overtime when it comes to public safety. The fire chief is going to tell you the same thing. You could have one fire, or you could have 10, uh, and it's going to hit your, your wages hard. So we're, we try to be responsible with it and we try to use it for what it was meant for, not for backfilling shifts because we're irresponsible with the schedule. All right. So on that, Mike, you did, I do see where, can you just explain because in 2019, I see that it was at $75,000 on that. And then we, and we've gone up, but we, to the 94,000, do, do you follow me? So just back in 19, we only used 75,000 for it. Right. Right. Well, that, that's kind of where I was going with that, Amy, is yeah. that um, we, I, I, I the, the overtime spending fluctuates based upon need. Uh, if we have a significant case and we need several officers working it on overtime or something like that, we need to be able to pull from that line. If we have a good year and we don't have significant major crimes or anything like what happened in this past year, that allows us the ability to be able to put that money back and give it back into free cash. This is the one line that fluctuates when it comes to spending. Okay. Uh, Fair enough. There's a couple. There's a couple other lines that will fluctuate based upon last year's spending, but I'll explain that in a second. There's a, especially with training and things like that, but I, I can explain that in a minute. Uh, actually, that's the next line: the, the uh, training situation. Don't look at last year um, for the training, uh, as well as for professional development. Uh, unfortunately, with COVID. That was the place where we got hit the most, ironically, with a training police reform bill going through. Uh, everything was canceled. Everything was just shut down. Uh, we were the only training that we were really able to do is the mandatory in-house training that we do every single year. So um, the training is the one that's really up in the air right now when it comes to uh, what we're looking for with the future. I jumped I, I jumped accidentally over the part-time officer situation. These two kind of go hand in hand, the part-time wages, as well as the training situation. I was on a three hour zoom meeting today with the secretary of public safety, the undersecretary, all their legal panels. And we are starting to just now, and it's a really unfortunate time to be learning this stuff, but we are starting to just now see what the reform bill is going to cost. Um, there's a lot of things that are going to be changing when it comes to part-time folks. And it also ties into this, um, it ties into the retention piece that I was talking about earlier is that there won't be part-time officers or special officers anymore. They are going to have one certification for police officers in the state and every person will have to 
meet those standards. That part of it, you are not going to get any argument out of me over that. 